Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this session on Eurasia and the modern Silk Road. I think we are all aware that Eurasia is becoming more important. But the question is, why? Why now? And I have my own theories, and I suggest three possible reasons. One is, of course, there's a brilliant new book written by Professor Wang Gangwu, who's actually the leading historian in Asia today. The title of the book is Eurasian Core. And he says that before the era of modern maritime European colonization, Eurasia was the center of world history forever. So what you may be seeing in some ways is the return of history to the natural, Eurasia returning to its natural place as the core of human history. That's one reason. Second reason could be geopolitics. And what's interesting is that if you look at the timing, as you know, the United States made a pivot to Asia, and then China made a pivot to Central Asia. <laughs> now, was that a link? <laughs> Or was that not a link? <laughs> it depends on your, your point of view. I suspect that there is a, maybe a policy by China to hedge its bets, to be less reliant on maritime routes, and to have an equal ability to require to use land routes and so on and so forth. So that may be one other factor too. And thirdly, of course, there are of course many new players. And this, was, this is what makes Eurasian story so interesting because there's so many players involved. And it's a very complex game. It's always been a complex area. So to this panel's discussion, therefore, couldn't be more timely. And some of you may be wondering, why is somebody from Singapore chairing this panel on Eurasia? I can tell you the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy has been actively working with Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan to help build the Graduate School of Public Policy there. So I've actually been to Astana many times myself. So I have a small, delicate feel of the situation. But let's begin uh, our discussion. I won't have uh, make lengthy introductions, but we have a very distinguished uh, panel. The, the Prime Minister of Georgia is with us on my left. Uh, I will not mispronounce your name. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, on my right is Mr. Mashkevich, uh, and he's the um, um, chairman of the board of directors of Eurasian Resource Group in Luxembourg. And on my extreme left, but that's not your that's not his political position, <laughs> is Mr. Andre Kostin, the president, president and chairman of VTB Bank Management Board uh, in Russia. And last but not least, uh, we have Sultan Ahmed bin Sulaim, the chairman of DP World from United Arab Emirates. So we have a really brilliant panel. And the, question, the first question I'm going to ask them is the obvious one is, what, what, do, each, what do each one of you see as the prospects for regional development uh, in Eurasia today? And I'm going to start with the prime minister. So if you don't mind, give us your views of what's happening from a broader perspective in the region. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, indeed, uh, the Silk Road Initiative, reconstruction of the economic Silk Road economic belt, or as it is called, One Belt, One Road Initiative, brings new momentum for developing um, economic ties in, in, on the Eurasian continent. Um, indeed, uh, Europe needs dynamism from China and from Asian countries, and vice versa. Uh, uh, Asian countries need new technologies and know-how from Europe. So this is a network of um, different routes uh, developing uh, connectivity between Europe and Asia. I can tell you about Georgia that we have recently uh, undertook uh, important changes to modernize our infrastructure, to modernize the railway, uh, we are completing the highway construction. We are working very closely with our neighbors in order to uh, develop holistic approach in managing Southern Caucasus Corridor together with uh, Kazakhstan and Central Asian countries. Recently, we had direct trains passing from Xinjiang province through Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Georgia towards Europe, either through the Black Sea or Turkey. So uh, this is developing quite fast, and we see increasing demands. The direct train from 
Xinjiang province to Tbilisi took uh, uh, seven days, the, uh, the latest train, which means that in about 10, 11 days, train can reach uh, from China to Constanza or Burgas um, <coughs> in Europe, which means that for companies who have um, uh, expensive goods to ship from China to Europe and vice versa, it decreases working capital requirements, so which is um, uh, turning this road into a very competitive one. But I would like to mention that this is not a rivalry between different roads. This is a uh, friendly competition, and I think it increases the economic dynamism in, on the whole Eurasian continents, I, I, continent. It, bring, it brings peace and understanding between different countries and among different countries. So it's a project of um, um, partnership, not competition. It's more partnership than competition. I can tell you that we have um, uh, ambitious plans to build a new deep sea port in Georgia, which is called Anaglia port, which, uh, which will be started in the nearest future. We have important reform agenda to liberalize further our tax system. We are one of the best in uh, easiness of doing business in the world. We have one of the lowest taxes in the world, and we are going to abolish profit tax in this year and liberalize further our tax administration and do some important changes derived from the free trade agreement with the European Union, which means that Georgia, with its free trade agreements with the whole region, uh, with all the regional countries, all the neighbors, plus with free trade agreement with all the European Union countries, and recently we launched free trade negotiations with China. So we are becoming, becoming one of the most open economies in the region with very liberal um, uh, regulations, with uh, relatively low energy costs, with relatively low labor costs and educated labor. So uh, we believe that in this partnership picture, Georgia will play its important role. But uh, with our uh, important uh, relations with the European Union, we are also trying to improve our relations with all our neighbors, yeah. including with Russia, of course. Yeah. We need to decrease political tensions yeah. and um, allow ourselves and all other countries to develop in a less tense environment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very comprehensive introduction. I'm very glad you mentioned One Belt, One Road, which, as you know, is a major uh, Chinese initiative. I was personally very confused when it first came out because the belt goes across the land and the road goes across the sea. So there was, uh, there's some confusion about that, but I think people are now beginning to understand what One Belt, One, one, belt, one Road uh, stands for. So, Mr. Mashkevich, I'm going to turn to you now because you have you know, extensive interest in the region, you know Kazakhstan well, so how, what's your perception? Uh, do you share the uh, optimism of the Prime Minister that this is all partnership and not geopolitical competition? First of all, we are share any optimism with, with any countries <laughs> and any people who could have it. But what I would like to say, of course, there is always competition for most effective, most short, and um, the best way how to deliver mm -hmm. any product. And of course, we just discussed yesterday with a group of people, could you imagine, let's say today, fracked of, less, let's say, of bauxites from west of Africa to China, $8. $8. From where, where? Sorry. From West Africa, let's, uh -huh. let's say from Guinea, uh -huh. bauxite. China. China. $8. How do you do that? I, not me. I am not in this business. Huh. That's why I'm saying, yes, it's very difficult to, to create most effective and most short way from, let's say, from China to Europe. But I agree with you. A thousand years, people try to found this way. And they always come to the same way, the silk way. Yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable. Could you imagine? Hundreds, hundreds of years ago, people try to found, they go through countries, through thousand kilometers, mm. to found the way where they could get more 
more result, and it was Silk Way. And uh, we are in Kazakhstan 25 years, and uh, we have 70,000 employees in our company in Kazakhstan. And we see great, great opportunities, great opportunities. Why? Uh, let's say 25 years ago, when Kazakhstan became independent, everybody discussed, is it possible <coughs> to make country successful if you don't have connections with ocean? How it could be? How you could be integrated to world economy without the ocean? But, but um, now everybody understands. You ocean, there is China. <laughs> you know, or maybe better than world ocean, I mean China. And uh, because of that, of unique geographic location of Kazakhstan, because uh, from north it's uh, Russia, great country, 150 million inhabitants. From uh, east, it's China. That's why more and more we understand that Silk Way, there is most stable and maybe most in future best way how to do it. And I would say last years, more and more coordination with countries uh, which really um, important to have this road. And uh, the, of course it's uh, Kazakhstan, of course it's China, of course it's Azerbaijan, of course it's Georgia, of course it's Russia. That's why, that's why I think today uh, today, it's great opportunity because, okay, I told today, sea way fracht very cheap, but there is many opportunities when Silk Way begin to work because it will open new opportunities, new new deposit of any minerals, uh, new development of any uh, new projects. That's why. I think today all, all uh, who are interested, all companies or all people who are interested in the most effective way how to deliver, deliver any product from South East, not only from China, from South East to Europe, have to focus to Silk Way. We are, we are sure, we are sure. And in Kazakhstan done, already done a lot, a lot. 2,700 kilometers away from West China to Europe, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, let's say, um, world-level example mm. what we have to do to, to, to implement these ideas. That's why we are quite optimistic. We are quite optimistic about uh, this opportunity. But, of course, all countries, my opinion, uh, and Prime Minister here of Georgia will understand me, need more coordination mm. and more, more coordination and more joint uh, implementation of strategy because countries continue follow their own interests, but this Silk Way possible only in full coordination between countries. Okay. That's why I would say Kazakhstan today of of, of this opportunity has a lot, a lot of potential. That's why I think everybody who would like implement today the ambitious, it right plate to do it. And uh, I wish to everybody <laughs> to be happy and healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think I'm beginning to drown in optimism. <laughs> So, Andre, uh, as you know, Russia has always played a very, very... In fact, Russia is in many ways the most important player, uh, has been for a long time in the region, Central Asian region. So your uh, perspectives uh, matter a, gr a great deal. And I wonder from your, pers your perspective uh, whether or not you share all this optimism. But I wonder also if you could maybe, uh, Andre, try to maybe b make a transition in the discussion towards discussing what you see also as some of the problems and challenges uh, that the region faces. As you know, no region in the world is all about harmony and cooperation. There are always challenges. So let's surface uh, a few of them so we can get a better understanding of the complexity uh, of Central Asia. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I think the regional uh, development, the regional integration, 
uh, is going to play the vital role uh, for the next decades, partly because I personally see that the global approach to the problem of, for example, liberalization of trade and other issues, economic, are diminishing very much. If you look at WTO, of course, new countries are joining. Kazakhstan is joining now. Russia joined recently. But for a number of reasons, we see no progress uh, on multilateral uh, trade talks. Uh, just on opposite, all the sanction, anti-sanctions, and uh, uh, growing competition led to a situation when we have probably less uh, liberal uh, regime in uh, uh, global trade than, than now. On the other hand, we see the growing uh, importance of the regional or some region-to-region -region agreement, like we have Trans-Pacific Agreement on Trade and Development. We are now talking about Transatlantic Agreement. So my uh, view that in the future, these regional programs or regional uh, agreement will play a much more important role uh, and to a certain extent replace the process of global liberalization and global development. Uh, the same is true about the institutions. We see a number of uh, new institutions uh, like uh, Asian, um, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, BRICS, New Development Banks, Silk Road Fund. So these new institutions been created to focus on, spe on specific regional uh, issues and regional de de development, which is, uh, I think, quite uh, an important uh, new element. Um, of course, when we talk about the um, uh, problem of Asia or Eurasian development, if you look at the map, you see that, of course, Europe and Asia represent uh, on the map one entity, but if we talk about the uh, transport logistic, uh, if we talk about economic ties, of course, there's still uh, two quite uh, different um, uh, entities. Russia, of course, again, by, by geography, by history, if you look, lies between Europe and Asia, and though we always consider ourselves Europeans, we're, we're not quite, uh, because to a very big extent, we belong to Asia, we belong to Pacific, and I think for us, the natural uh, way of uh, further growth, further development is to have uh, better ties uh, with Asia. We recognize it partly as we started the process of uh, creating a Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, there was some concern in the West that Russia is trying to rebuild the Soviet Union uh, to a certain extent, but, but it is not. I think just recognition that uh, uh, the former uh, Soviet Union uh, republics now being independent uh, countries still have very close ties and relationship and the interdependence in their economy. And I think it will be natural to benefit from, from uh, cooperation uh, with, uh, among these countries and to create uh, a real integrated economy, which I think will benefit uh, all participants. But on the other hand, Russia is very much welcomed the Chinese um, um, initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative. We, this year, early this year, uh, last year now, 2015, we signed the, uh, some agreement uh, between Eurasian Economic Union and um, um, the Belt and Road, uh, Road Initiative. And uh, I think we have a lot of potential for Russia being a country between Asia and Europe uh, to benefit from this. Though, of course, um, we still have to see how this uh, concept will be implemented because it's a quite wide range uh, uh, concept. Uh, of course, there's many obstacles on this. There's a very different countries involved in this cooperation. We definitely see China as a dominant force in this process. Uh, the China, which is a um, growing, uh, in spite of all the problems, growing into um, uh, a leading uh, economic nation and uh, the nation which wants to uh, be a leader in, in Asian part uh, and um, most um, successful in economic development and uh, uh, in spending money on this project. But still we believe that uh, Russia is uh, eager to join uh, this initiative. We, uh, as I said, we uh, very much view relationship with China as a, extremely important for Russia. It's our neighbor. Uh, it's a country with whom we have a quite a big economic ties, and we would like to expand this. Uh, but not only with China, of course, the countries like Kazakhstan and other countries in, in, in Central Asia, in Caucasus region, uh, as a, our important partners. Um, and um, 
uh, Georgia, for example. I mean, I, I'm, I'm proud that in spite of all the political difficulties, my bank was working in Georgia all through this time mm. quite successfully. And we also had support from the Georgian government, and we are very thankful for this because we really want to have a very good relationship with Georgia. We think it's an important partner for a traditional historical uh, partner and friend for, for, for Russia. So I think there will be many obstacles, but I think this concept will... Uh, will will will, uh, will be leaving. I think that that, that that is a quite important. I think all the nations in this region uh, accept the importance of this and see a lot of benefits. Yeah, thank thank you, Andre. I'm glad you mentioned that uh, China has continued to do well because I can tell you, walking around Davos, uh, uh, so many people are asking me, is the Chinese economy going to crash? And as you know, you saw the communist, you saw the Economist cover story with a picture of Xi Jinping riding a dragon that is about to crash. And I completely disagree with the Economist cover story. Xi Jinping is going to bring the Chinese dragon up and not the Chinese dragon down. <laughs> we'll forget about this next Davos. <laughs> Nobody will mention problem with China, I'm sure. <laughs> so we now let's turn to Sultan. And I, th and I think you'll probably bring a different perspective. Because if you look at uh, the role of uh, UAE and the Gulf region, it's focused primarily on what I would call the maritime routes. And now with people shifting logistics from maritime routes to transcontinental routes. How is that going to affect the logistics business? And uh, are you going to stop uh, buying ships and buying more trains? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very honored and pleased to be with you here in this important uh, meeting. Uh, we are quite interested in, uh, in this concept. Um, the, you mentioned the Silk Route was the oldest, and that's true because in the, in the, it is the, one of the main routes of the trade, that even one of the points of the Silk Route toward Africa was Dubai. The uh, Silk Route didn't develop because, developed in the past because maritime transport was not reliable. Mm. Uh, as modern vessels were in the market and uh, development of the steamship, uh, the Silk Route lost it is important. Uh, today, of course, the revival of this uh, Silk Route, we had extensive meeting with our uh, partners and friends in Kazakhstan. Mm. We are actually advising the government of Kazakhstan on the logistic park in Hargus. We are managing the Aktau port, uh, which will, one part of the cargo will go to Aktau and to Baku and then to probably Anzali, to Iran and, uh, and to us eventually. Uh, the Silk Route reduces the time for a container to reach Europe. Today, by sea, it takes 42 days. Mm -hmm. By train, it takes 12 days. Wow. And there was about... And the cost, and the cost, 42 to 12, the cost goes down significantly? No, cost, cost is a different subject. <laughs> uh, different subject, we'll come to it. But uh, the, uh, in fact, about five, six months ago, the, we, we tested uh, a container from China and it reached Europe in 12 days. Wow. Uh, the, you spoke about the uh, coast and uh, my colleague just spoke about coast. I mean, the shipping industry in, in, in a very difficult situation now. Yes. There's overcapacity. Yes. Everybody built big vessels and bigger vessels. The market did not uh, uh, adjust. Uh, you know, exactly. adjust to it. Uh, so there is overcapacity. Uh, a container from China to Europe used to be fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars. Mm. Today it's three to four hundred dollars. Wow! So obviously they are losing a lot. Mm. Now, when you talk about the cost for the train, it's about four thousand five hundred dollars mm. to five thousand. Wow! So <coughs> still, uh, when you look at why China, in our opinion, is very interested in this, China is facing a few. Challenges. One of the challenges is the rising cost of employment. We are in, uh, in Qingdao. We operate, we have a port, we own a port in Qingdao, Tianjin, and Yantai. And we've been facing, for the past seven years, 20% increase in labor cost. And China is realizing that, and they are trying to remove the industry from the coastline mm. to inland. In fact, there is a plan to build a huge industrial area just on the border of Kazakhstan. Now, when that happens, then, of course, the cost of Chinese products coming to Europe will be less because mm. then you need to travel so many thousand miles. Right. But at the moment, uh, that cost is there. Now, items of high value 
And uh, you, you talk about, for example, copy machines, uh, computers, and so on. It's five thousand dollars, nothing, because for them, the important thing is to reach on time. Especially some of these items that are in need, like uh, Apple, for example, telephones. When they are launching one, they need to be there fast. So the competition of the train, in my opinion, will be with the airplanes more than the ship. Because sell it, send it in 12 days, you can wait 12 days. You cannot wait 42 days for a consignment to reach. Yeah. So I see a huge potential for this. And I believe this will not reduce the, 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 the dependence on ships. I think the intermodal concept uh, mm. is a fantastic concept whereby a country can utilize maritime, road, rail, and air. And with this concept, you, you, you have basically fulfilled all the mode of transportation. Yeah. At the end of the day, we are all talking about efficiency. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Now, I share the optimism that many of you have expressed, but if you don't mind, I'm going to ask each one of you a, uh, a somewhat difficult question, but please give me very short answers, uh, because I think it's time to bring the audience in uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but the, the, my question to you is this. You know, there's no region without problems and challenges. Can each one of you just suggest one problem or one challenge that you think will probably surface in the next 12 months? And I can guarantee you, in any region, there'll be negative headlines in the next 12 months. So what will that negative headline be about the Eurasian region in the next one to three or four years? You know? So I'm going to start with you, Andre. What do you see as a potential uh, problem or challenge that might surface that we, may be difficult to solve? Well, I think the uh, process of uh, transition of the economies uh, in Asia, for example, China is the, now in transit from the export-oriented investment yeah. to the uh, local consumer service consumer policy. Deal. Yeah. And, and to a certain extent, the similar, the similar cases in other some nations. So I think yeah. the, the change, the technological change, the change of the uh, economic um, environment uh, in yeah. general, and the necessity to change yeah. uh, the economy, uh, the structure yeah. of the economy, I think that's a big challenge for uh, new Asian countries. Yeah, no, I, I agree. In fact, as, as you know, the <laughs> slowdown of the Chinese economy has brought on commodity prices very sharply, you know. And so that's one example of a challenge that has surfaced. So, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you see? I know Prime Ministers don't talk about negative things, but try. <laughs> no, the, for us, uh, I can tell you, for our region generally, the challenge is uh, falling uh, oil prices. Uh -huh. uh, because for a country like Georgia, which is less industrialized and which is focused more on trade and commodities, uh, falling of the oil prices means the falling of the investment appetite in the oil countries, mm -hmm. who are the most uh, important FDI providers for Georgia. Uh -huh. mm. That is why we, we are not benefiting from this uh, process. Uh, we mm -hmm. are suffering along with the oil countries. Mm -hmm. So that means that we need to do more extraordinary things inside Georgia, mm -hmm. like... Um, cutting further the budget costs and mm -hmm. uh, giving more oxygen to the private sector, mm -hmm. liberalizing tax system like abolishing mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. tax, uh, uh, tax on the income, taxing only the distributed yeah. uh, earnings, which means that we will mobilize more investment resources internally. So mm -hmm. I think uh, this is where we are now. And uh, I think this will be the biggest challenge in the, uh, in the next year. Um, for us, it's, it, it is the biggest challenge. As so the, yeah. our friend Alexander Mashkevich mm -hmm. mentioned, also the challenge is also the cooperation level between these and among these countries, because yeah. unless we have excellent cooperation and coordination, mm -hmm. uh, the Silk Road cannot be as effective mm -hmm. as it should be. So mm -hmm. this is another challenge to improve the customs and border crossing procedures mm -hmm. and uh, come up with unified, unified tariff systems, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So this is another challenge. But the biggest challenge probably is the yeah. falling of the oil prices for everyone uh, okay. in, in our region. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned low oil prices. By the way, just very quickly, since you mentioned regional cooperation, actually at lunch today I'm going to be speaking about ASEAN, the, As the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and describing how ASEAN has become the second most successful regional organization in the world. And I'm going to suggest that Central Asia, can, Eurasia can look at what ASEAN is doing in some areas or so. Uh, so, Mr. Mashkevich, uh, come on, tell us a really difficult problem. <laughs> I will tell you a really difficult problem. Just one hour ago, we discussed that. 
we are talking about a uh, situation that what we are discuss today, it's not crisis, it's new reality. I think there is biggest problem and biggest challenge. Why? Be if it's like that, but more and more people think it's like that. For all countries of this region, of CIA, all CIS countries, all it has to completely change direction, completely. Mm. This country needs reforms, mm. serious reforms, mm. diversification, absolutely different way to do it. There is biggest challenge, because in this case, these countries have to completely change strategy, completely. There is the biggest change, and let's say today, in Kazakhstan, it's great opportunity, privatization, total privatization. And I think it's absolutely right decision because impossible, impossible to continue uh, like or, it was or, or before. Yeah, oh, I'll get, doesn't matter, any, any. Impossible to, to government to own companies. <coughs> That's why I'm saying there is the biggest challenge because if country will not make serious reforms, make economy liberal. Everybody knows uh, recipe, everybody knows, but it's difficult to implement. I think if countries will not do it in another one, two, three years, it will be a disaster because it's new reality. That is the biggest challenge. Good, that's excellent. I mean, privatization is inherently difficult. Uh, please, I want to remind the audience I'll be coming to you after I hear from Sultan. So please prepare short, sharp, and challenging uh, questions, but to, please don't make long speeches. <laughs> so, Sultan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as a challenge I see, you now we're talking about the Silk Route. Uh, the, in my opinion, it is a matter of procedures uh, of clearing cargo, of accepting that this cargo is gonna go and move without untouched, uninspected. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, for this to succeed, we have to reduce the time it takes because in certain countries still the procedure, the documentation should be the same. The, the border procedures. Yes, and should we should have really, ideally should have a document that basically everybody accepts or the same document. In the Gulf countries we did this with the GCC countries whereby uh, we have exactly the same declaration or import or bill of entry so that everybody knows about it. Uh, second challenge is technology. We have to really use the best technologies as mm. far as pre-clearing the cargo. In other words, when, when a container is coming, they should be doing the pre-clearing yeah. ahead of time. And yes. also we should avoid paper. It should mm. be really paperless. Electronic, yeah. Because with, with paper, a lot of doubt comes. With electronics, it is difficult to cheat. It's also easy to retrieve information. Mm. So if a custom officer needs to check something, they can, instead of asking for a document, they can find it with a click of a button. Yeah. Now, I was, uh, I, I must say, I was very impressed with the customs in Azerbaijan. Uh -huh. They are way advanced in, the, in the procedure, yes. Way advanced, I'm really pleased. I mean, we, we are advanced in Dubai, but we, we, we've seen a country that really have almost paperless, the ability to clear, the ability to, to basically uh, pre-clear uh, and inspect. This is important because when you talk about the Silk Road, you talk about logistics, you talk about efficiency. At the end of the day, how do we cut cost? Every time they stop, every time they delay, it's a cost. Mm. I'm surprised you didn't mention Singapore. <laughs> 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 anyway, so uh, the floor is open and would anybody like to ask the first uh, challenging question? Yes, I see a hand at the back, please. Uh, if you don't mind, identify yourself and pose your question. Um, my name is Dick Evans, and uh, I uh, work for Samrat Kazina in Kazakhstan. Um, first thing I'd like to do is to completely endorse um, Alexander, what you have said. We are in a completely different environment and age today um, in the whole of the Central Asia region, and I think this applies to virtually every single one of the former uh, Soviet republics. And it is this fundamental reform that is required. And actually, because of the circumstances that we're living in today, this is a time when I suspect you can actually do it. Whereas when we were booming at $100 a barrel, I mean, it would have been much, much more difficult. Hmm. I mean, I had the 
the difficulty of being in some ways a privilege of being working for the very first of Margaret Thatcher's privatizations in the UK. And, and I'm talking here in the UK at a time when the economy was doing pretty well. And I subsequently had the task of shedding 50,000 people as a direct result of privatization and the drive for greater efficiency, cost reduction, uh, and to satisfy the shareholders in terms of sort of dividend growth and capital appreciation. Now, I haven't seen in Kazakhstan, and I haven't seen it anywhere else in that part of the world, mm. a real understanding of the consequences of what these changes will bring about. And the biggest danger that I foresee in these areas as a result of the fundamental changes that have to take place mm. is the question of social unrest. Because when you begin to shed employment, as will inevitably happen in order to get efficiencies, the, the key target, and in many ways, regrettably, the easiest target is cutting numbers of people. It takes time to take investment out of a business, but actually employees are a very sort of easy issue to take. And most of these businesses are hugely, I mean, over-endowed with people, which is a part of the inefficiency of them. And to me, I mean, we need alongside these changes a plan for dealing with the consequences, which, as I say, I believe could very easily be very substantial sort of social unrest. Okay. Thank you. I think that's, that's a good challenge. So should I turn to you and to try and see how you respond to that? I mean, let's say we go, he mentioned Kazakhstan. If you do have this real privatization and uh, lots more unemployment, how do you deal with the social unrest? You know, let's um, assume you're prime no, minister no, no, for no. one day. No, I will tell you. First of all, first of all, I'm very proud to say that. Let's say a uh, few years ago, President Zuma uh, of South Africa came to Kazakhstan and he visited our enterprises. And he was completely shocked because he told social package which we give to our employees. It's unbelievable. And he never saw in any, in any mining company in South Africa, you see it's so many serious Anglo-American and, and uh, serious company working. That's why, yes, it's big, big responsibility. But from very beginning, in Kazakhstan and the uh, leader of Kazakhstan, President Nazarbayev, he um, contributed a lot of time uh, to, to, uh, to be sure that companies who work in Kazakhstan give real social security to people. That's why we begin to prepare ourselves to such way when we have to reduce number of people. That's why we create serious network of new education centers, which will give for people new skills, new profession, which we will be sure we could we could be sure that people will be busy. And we do it. We do it, but we do it systematically. It needs years and years. Impossible to do it for one month or one, one year. We begin to do it eight, ten years ago. We, we invest a lot of money to that. But today we are quite comfortable because, because we know what to do. Not so many companies could do it. But we prepare ourselves because, of course, with today's reality, like we say, yes, social uh, situation will have more and more tension. It is true. But we have to ready for that. Let's say, let's say because of new and new uh, uh, kind of production, which, which we will try to have, uh, we make diversification and we move people from one kind of enterprise to new one, but we do it systematically. Only, only this way could be possible to control uh, social, social stability. That's a very good point. Next question. Mark, please. Again, introduce yourself, please. I'm Mark Leonard. I'm the chairman of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of talk about win-win cooperation in this part of the world, but 
Um, yeah, be throw, throw some skepticism in there. <laughs> um, I, I'd love to hear from the panel where you see the biggest points of tension between the different regional integration projects in Eurasia, between One Belt, One Road, between the Eurasian Economic Union, what Turkey's doing, what the European Union uh, is trying to do in your part of the world. Hmm. So, Mr. Prime Minister, do you want to start? I mean, then well, I'll ask Andre after that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I... Absolutely, honestly, I would not see any reason for tensions because, mm. as it was mentioned, there are the one belt, one road does not mean virtually one belt or one road. That's right, yes. It's a network of coronary arteries That's right. linking Europe and Asia. So mm. it means that there are different ways of linking two parts of this continent, which means more connections and more opportunities for bringing these regions closer. As it was mentioned by the representative of the uh, DP world, uh, it, it, it means it's very important, especially for high value goods, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, time becomes shorter and shorter. So I don't see any reason for creating tensions derived from this project. I think this is more uh, opportunity for closer cooperation among all these countries and for bringing more peace. And uh, of course, countries will try to reform themselves. Countries will try to uh, to be more competitive and routes will try to more competitive and try countries alongside different routes will try to cooperate better among each other, which means more competition, which means more efficient economies but efficiency, increasing efficiency, always brings some challenges. But these challenges are more internal challenges than international challenges. So if countries cope with those internal challenges, I think uh, the, the economy will be more efficient overall on the continent. So mm. I don't see any reason for increasing tensions. Andre? Oh, I, think, I think there, there could be a competition, of course, among uh, nations. Uh, which route should be the main avenue, and which one should be a small street, probably. Yeah. Because we've got two, fact, was, two destinations. We have Europe, we have China, uh, two major economic powers. Yeah. And in between, uh, there is a country which will benefit from, from this route. But uh, there's a south, north, uh, and central route. And I think that there should be some competition, is actually which one will... So the north route is the Trans-Siberian Railway, right? Yeah. Through across Russia, yes, the across southern Russia. route will go which way? Through which countries? I think it, 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 it can go to the south, to the south, to the south, yeah. yeah. So, Good. if you look at the map, we should... <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to figure Turkey. out where you see your competition for the Trans-Siberian Railway. Yeah. No, I, I think the, the, the actually um, there are some countries which are saying to the, going through Caucasus, of course, yeah. and going uh, then to Europe. Yeah, but you but you do you, you see competition rather than tensions. Yeah, I don't think there's any tensions. I think Russia is saying that Russian route has the one advantage that you you have uh, effectively one country yeah. in between, uh, and then uh, quite correctly, gentlemen mentioned about the documentation yeah. and everything and yeah. speed. Speed is yeah. quite important, and uh, the the ground route is very important because now only four, I think four percent of the trade between yeah. China and U and the European Union is channeled. Yeah. Uh, by land, yeah. uh, mainly by sea through the Suez Channel, yeah. uh, and of course, uh, in order to get a, to win a, a bigger part of this and to benefit from mm. from the economic belt, as we're saying, that's quite important. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to build on this question on challenges and ask Sultan a question. You know, uh, I'm told I'm, I'm not sure whether it's absolutely true. I hear that the, the Chinese have actually succeeded in establishing a train route that goes from China to a port in Iran. The train is started already. So when that kind of train route starts, is that good news for the Gulf region, or do you see that as a challenge for the Gulf region? Hey, let me tell you this. When you talk about the China route, yeah. they, they are well connected uh, with the Kazakh rail, with the Russian rail, with the Turkmenistan rail, yeah. and with Iran. With Iran, uh, too. Yeah. With Iran. Iran, either through Turkmenistan, through Ashgabat, or from Aktau to the port of Anzali, hmm. and then... Iran has a very good network of railroads. Mm. So eventually, if you think about it, Chinese power could come by rail to India. Mm. 
by this route. Really? Which means it will go to Shahidar Jai port. It will go to basically Aktau. So it will go to, from Iran to India? It goes, goes back from India, absolutely. Absolutely. It could happen. So basically, this is good news for us because there are more routes, more connection. And bear in mind, there are many landlocked countries, yeah. CIS countries, that would need this. This mm. gives them, basically, Iran will give them the sea connection yeah. and the rail to Europe. Yeah. Great. Sure. Excuse me, excuse me. I, I found the map. There's a three possibility. <laughs> the northern, that is Western China, Kazakhstan, Russia, and EU, the yeah. central. Yeah. Western China, Kazakhstan, uh, Caucasus uh, countries like uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia, yeah. Turkey, and EU. And the possibility of the south, which is China, South Asia, Iran, Indian Ocean. Okay. Great. I'm glad you brought your research <laughs> along. <laughs> I see a hand from a lady over there. After that, we're going to go to our final round of comments. Please, go ahead. Yes. And I uh, wanted to um, ask a question about this, uh, the, the challenges, um, because I also uh, chair or I'm vice chair of the uh, Global Agenda Council on Anti-Corruption and Transparency. And so um, I wondered on two things. Uh, what, as we um, are excited about the mobility that comes from uh, this opportunity, what, um, what is being put in place to assure um, the, uh, the um, issue of corruption, um, that it'll be a, a consistent way of addressing this across boundaries so things don't get slowed up and don't disappear? And the second thing is, with all the terrorism going on in the mm. world, um, what provisions are being taken to take into account mm. the security uh, of the routes that are um, being proposed? Well, you're a brave woman. You suggest you raise some difficult challenges, corruption <laughs> and terrorism. Well, things that, you know, aren't necessarily <laughs> inner in <laughs> rivalries uh, among the countries with goodwill yeah. want to make something happen, but there yeah. are external uh, threats True. to that. True. I don't know who wants to start. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, corruption and terrorism. Well, thank you for bringing up this issue because, uh, indeed, the Silk Road uh, opportunity is a huge incentive uh, mm. in order to clean ourselves mm. uh, from this disease, as uh, it is corruption, because mm. with corruption, it will be absolutely impossible mm. to reach the level of competitiveness which would allow us to uh, o propose uh, to the owners of the goods to choose mm different routes, so the elimination of corruption is one of the main prerequisites for choosing one or the other route, which means that this is a huge incentive, and it, it incentivizes all the countries alongside different routes uh, to tackle this, uh, this problem. And, the co uh, and also, likewise, um, the anti-terrorism activities should be coordinated better and better. Uh, without this, it is impossible to develop this connectivity and mobility mm. uh, between these two yeah. parts of Eurasian continent. Thank you. Well, please. Thank you. Yeah, microphone is right there, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Chuboy, Sanatoli, Russia. So this... Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Everyone knows Anatoly, right? <laughs> <laughs> this uh, great discussion about this uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, which is definitely a strong geopolitical decision, which will probably change the whole landscape from Russia, Georgia, Caucasus, Kazakhstan, Arab countries. And for me personally, it's uh, just uh, one country meeting in this discussion is China. Uh -huh. So my provocative question to you, Dr. Mavobani, <laughs> is it coincidence? <laughs> no, I would say, uh, just uh, let me quickly respond to my friend. Uh, I would say China has been the subtext in, in much of this discussion. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Prime Minister did point out that the slowdown of the Chinese economy uh, is having ripple effects uh, all across the region, and it's going to be a... a uh, a big challenge. And of course, the, the, I, I suspect what's behind your question is uh, what are China's geopolitical motives for going into Central Asia? Is it just purely about economics or is it more than economics? And of course, I suspect the correct answer is that there is economics and there is more than economics. There's geopolitical considerations also 
uh, at play. But the thing about the Chinese, and this is just my personal view, is that they're remarkably patient. They're not in any hurry. They believe in working slowly, gradually, and 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you have a whole new reality. I mean, look at Southeast Asia, how China has become our number one trading partner. China was never our number one trading partner, then boom. After it, uh, it opened up, we are now our number one trading partner of China. So that, that's the changes that's happening. So anyway, I see, I see the clock moving. Uh, is there any one last pressing question? Yes, please. And then I'm going to give the panelists two minutes each to conclude. So uh, with their reflections on what is the big message they would like to give to the audience on the future before, they, before our session ends. That's basically the last question for all of you. But please. <clears throat> Um, Dennis Kolga, Minsk Shepherds Hub, Belarus. So a small remark. Also, one another country is missing this discussion. Uh. Belarus, especially as a major part of the like, uh, northern part of the Great Silk Road. So, dear speakers, what is your opinion about uh, Belarus like a major transit part of this northern part of the Great Silk Road? Also, because now China Great World Corporation relies on Belarus big uh, like investment project at the uh, industrial park near Minsk called Great Stone. Now it's like the major investment proposition in the Republic of Belarus. Mm. Thank you. So I don't know who's... Uh, Andre, you want to touch the question on Belarus? So. You can't go from Russia to uh, Europe uh, avoiding Belarus. So definitely on the, on the Silk Road. <laughs> and I think that that's, that, that, that's part of, uh, of it. And also Belarus is a member of Eurasian Economic Union, so I think there's definitely a role uh, for Belarus in this process, and there's definitely benefit uh, for Belarus from this process. And um, Belarus is a very close ally of Russia and a good economic partner, so we definitely see a role for, for Belarus uh, as well as for Russia. So I think uh, there are no pressing questions. I'm going to invite, and I'm, go I'm going to go there maybe in a reverse order among the panelists. And so I'll start with you, Sultan, then I'll uh, go to, I think, uh, Andre, then Mr. Mashkevich, and then uh, the Prime Minister. What, 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 what's the final reflection you want to put across to the uh, audience about how you see as a prospects? Uh, for Eurasia? Bearing in mind, we've, we've discussed the optimistic points, we've discussed the challenges. What on balance is your vision or what do you see coming? Um, I might disagree with a lot of uh, things about China. We operated huh. in China for the past seven years. Disagree? I, I, I disagree with a lot of the uh, news about China. Where the pessimism on China. Pessimism on China. China is almost 6.9% growth. I mean, that's good for anybody yeah. today. Today, one of the biggest growth is in Indonesia. Is almost seven. China is six point nine. India, I think, is about five. No, India is seven point three. Which yeah. one? Huh? India. India. India seven point three. India seven point three. Yeah. Amazing. So, China, in my opinion, uh, is uh, definitely going to utilize the, the Silk Route. Uh, China market is strong. Uh, China had a double-digit growth with anybody can tell you that you cannot sustain double-digit growth. It's mm. impossible. Uh, the Chinese local market is very big. It's absorbing anything they can produce. Uh, the economy is good. Uh, there are pessimism about uh, <coughs> some Western analysts, analysts, which I disagree with them. We are operating. We see growth in our business in China in, in all the three uh, locations. Uh, with that in mind, I think the prospect for the Silk Route is great, and I believe that uh, as we, uh, as more and more containers pass through the route, you will see the price eventually coming down. Hmm. Definitely. Good. So Good. I'm very positive about it. So very optimistic. Andre? No, I, I'm also quite positive on this. I think we should recognize, uh, answering Anatoly's question, we should recognize China as, as a leading uh, economic nation and definitely having probably excessive facilities for infrastructure development. They already held a um, Summer Olympics in Beijing, they will have Winter Olympics in Beijing. After that, they'll probably have free facilities to build infrastructure anywhere else in the world, in Asia and, and somewhere else. So uh, I believe that this process will, will take place. And uh, 
I, I would definitely uh, see some uh, political motivation for this, but I think we should recognize the growing role of China and, and this outside uh, international expansion, particularly with a focus on, uh, on Asia and uh, Asia to uh, Europe uh, cooperation. So I'm quite positive. I think th things will take place and there will be development of this process in the next decades. So, Mr. Mashkevich. I don't know will you like it or not, but I'm not so optimistic about China. Why? Ah, good. A different point of view. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I, I will tell to you. Because last 15 years, uh, consumption of uh, all commodities growing 4% per year, last 15 years, only because of China. And uh, let's say in 21st century, first new, for example, iron ore, big, big deposit, uh, Carajas in Brazil, was opened 2008. Before, something similar was opened in 1986. Could you imagine? 20 years, it was not dramatic investment to, uh, to, to iron ore. Yeah. And it was done because of China. And it was hundreds, billions investment, trillions investment worldwide because of expectation of China. And with growing 7%, it will be completely, all investment will be completely stopped because consumption will grow down dramatically. Dramatically, that's why. And <coughs> we are quite active in China. We quite not pessimistic. We are really, let's say, worried because, let's say, 50% of production in China not profitable. They donate. I have a meeting with Chalco just yesterday. Chalco is the biggest aluminum company of China. They continue to produce, but they lose money. To, uh, let's say cost production for Chalco, $2,000 per ton of aluminum. They sell 1300 today, and they are not going to stop it. They are, going, they are going to build new enterprise. That's why today China killer of any, any uh, let's say, metallurgy or mining initiative. That's why it's a big problem. Big, and they're not going to stop such strategy. They're not going to stop. Of course, Silk Road, Silk Road has future, of course. But I agree with Mr. Kostin, chairman of VTB. There is question of competition. Question because there are many ways what, how to move product or any, any kind what you have to deliver from South East. That's why competition. If we will give in Silk Road better condition, it will be more safe. If not, that's why I agree, competition. Okay, Mr. Prime Minister, you have the last word, but unfortunately, we have one minute left. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I really believe that underlying trend in China is positive, uh, mm. despite all ups and downs that they have experienced during the last recent period. We believe that um, uh, the competition uh, which was created by the Silk Road Initiative only drives countries towards better future and towards more competitiveness, which means reforms, which means uh, positive changes uh, alongside all the routes, northern, uh, central, and southern routes. So I, I, we believe that this will be a very positive change in the, on the Eurasian continent, which will drive Eurasian economy towards <coughs> more competitive, more efficient economy. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you used the word uh, competition, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, because that was a word I was going to uh, conclude with. And I think at the end of the day, clearly there'll be definitely growing competition in the region, but the competition, I think, will lead to uh, beneficial results. And while there'll be ups and downs, uh, I believe that the region, we have this as an optimistic uh, uh, future for the region. But I hope the discussion has brought out the complexity uh, of the, uh, the challenges that the, also the region also faces. And this is, of course, a result of having a very distinguished panel. So please join me now in thanking this very distinguished panel for their con contributions. <laughs>